Before we get to the program, the news had a really interesting article about the millionaire that died in California and left all his money to the San Andreas. Did, did you see that? Left all his money to the San Andreas. He wanted to be remembered as being generous to a fault. <laughs> and also for any Spanish speakers in the audience tonight, me llamo en español Ricardo Pequeño. This is a name I like so much better than Richard Little, but <laughs> Ricardo Pequeño. Okay. So, in any event, let's take a look at this amazing place here in the Holyoke Range. And it's very, very appropriate that we're in Holyoke for all intents and purposes to talk about this range. So, there's a lot of stuff here coming down the pike tonight. I hope it's not going to be too much for you. Oops, the handouts are gone. <clears throat> if you didn't get a handout, please email me and I will send you the electronic version or mail you a printed version. Uh, so that's one thing for you. So there is a handout of a map. I'll show you what it looks like. So we have a map and a cross-section diagram here. Also, if there's anyone that is interested in one of the tours that I do, um, I have a tour listing that's over here as well. And I thought I would also bring my favorite rock here today. This is, this is my pet rock. I carry this everywhere, which is why I have a <laughs> I have pants with very large pockets. But take a look at this. This is a rock that has light and dark banding in it. It's a metamorphic rock and it's nice. And that's the G-N-E-I-S-S, -S, nice. So this is a nice, nice rock. This is really a nice rock. So this underwent metamorphism. It was probably part of an old magma chamber, maybe 400 million years ago. Continents collided. We made Pangaea. Remember Pangaea? Some of you older folks in the audience? <laughs> when all the continents were together. And big mountains were here. So this came from the middle of mountains. It was really squeezed. But as it came closer to the surface and got cool, it was probably part of the breakup of Pangaea because here's a rock with a fault. Look at that. It's got offset of those layers right here. So this is a fossil earthquake, folks. There was an earthquake that broke this rock, moved one side relative to the other, and that probably happened when the continents were shifting apart. So anyway, this is my favorite rock. It came from a Glacial deposit over in Irving, over near the French King Bridge. One of my students found it and presented it to me. And there it is. So who knows what you can find. The point is, no matter what rock you have, there are great stories in the rocks, but also in the landscapes. So rocks and landscapes, great geological stories, deep history. So you can see my pet rock. So I have some other things here for you to see. The most unusual would be the armored mud balls, and I always bring those around because they are so unusual. They're found nearby to the Holyoke Range, but not in the Holyoke Range. They're in sedimentary rocks, not in the basalt. So um, anyway, go see an armored mud ball. They're only found in about 10 other places in the world. And this is the only place that you'll actually be able to see a sample. Otherwise, they're stuck in a mountainside somewhere, you know, and you really can't get them out. But these were quarried back uh, in the 1860s when they built a bridge across the Connecticut River. And they, I don't know if they realized what they had, but the old bridge is now gone and we were able to take these samples in big blocks out of the bridge abutment. This is, it was a suspension cable uh, anchor that was holding these things together. And then one of those big rocks, the size of the podium here, broke. And I was able to take that section into a rock saw and get it cut so that you can see it today. Otherwise, they're too big. We have them in their full size over at Greenfield Community College. You can go and walk our little geopath there at Greenfield Community College and see the armored mud balls. Or you can go to Unity Park in Turnus Falls. And that's where the old bridge went across between Turnus Falls and Gill. And you can see some samples right there, too, that are left remaining by the river. So that's my armored mud ball story. And now, let's find my remote, which I put over here. Thank you. And let's take a look at 
the amazing geology stories in the Holyoke range. There we go. Let's talk about spelling for a second because there's holy and there's holy. So we're talking about holy basalt, basalt with holes. We're not talking about a rock that Jesus touched. We're talking about holy basalt, a basalt with, a basalt with holes. And the holes are due to gas bubbles and we call those vesicles. And sometimes you'll find a green mineral. It's called olivine, also known as peridot, the August birthstone. And I really like this, this mineral because it's the first mineral to form in a magma chamber. So imagine that, a magma chamber deep underground is crystallizing. All those elements are coming together. And the iron, manganese, and oxygen come together and form this crystal. And then if there's an eruption, what happens, because see, basalt, as you know, is lava. It has to come up from a magma chamber. And so as it comes up from the magma chamber, sometimes these crystals will be rafted up with the, the other liquids and they'll get cooled quickly and be trapped along with the gas bubbles. So this is how they get there. Interesting story. Now, holy basalt. How would you like an example of a holy basalt? Let's take a look at this. Well, we go <clears throat> to 1950, uh, roughly 43 to 52. Some of us remember this from our elementary school times, more or less, when the farmer was, the Mexican farmer was in the field and there was an earthquake and there was a crack and the lava came up out of the crack and it built the volcano you see in the background and it kept flowing and flowing and flowing and there was a church and the lava did not knock the church over, it just went to it. So, the lava goes to the church. So I think that's kind of a holy basalt episode there. And now, what if I talked about basalt, only basalt? There would be a holy basalt talk. Is this getting really bad? <laughs> if this lava came from Pericotine, it would be a holy, holy, holy basalt talk. And I'm done. <laughs> uh, does anyone want to leave at this point? <laughs> okay, so let's take a look at basalt holes. The biggest basalt holes are lava tubes. Basalt comes out liquid, of course, and it solidifies along the top. The middle is still fluid, and the middle will drain out, and this will create a lava tube. And uh, here's one in California. You can walk down into this um, undeveloped tube. Well, it's got a stairway into it, but it's not lit or anything like that. But when you get in, at about noontime, when the sun is high in the sky, there are cracks in the ceiling that allow the sunlight in. And you can see these streams of sunlight coming into the middle of a lava flow, into a lava tube. If we go to Hawaii, you can really see this concept rather nicely here. Uh, in the background where you see the arrow, that's Mauna Ulu. It's about 100 feet high. It's about maybe a mile or so away from this view. And you can see when it erupted back in the 70s. And here's a, right at the roadside, you see that the surface of the lava has cooled and the middle has just drained away. It left the lava tube. Um, same thing right next to that first one that you saw. You see a whole bunch of these holes in the lava that, where the middle just drained away. A big one is called the Thurston Lava Tube in Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. How many people have been there? If you've been to Hawaii, you must have been there. Okay. So when you go into here, once again, big open area because the middle of the lava flow just drained out. And you know that there are some lava tubes in Hawaii that are 20, have 20 miles of cave uh, volume distance within them. So, what happens when lava enters a forest? Can you imagine that? This is a helicopter view from 2014. And um, the lava is flowing from a volcano that's just visible on the upper left there. And it's flowing out of cracks and just coming this way and going into the greenish area, which is a forested area. And there's a couple of uh, ages of flows here. Can you perhaps tell that the darker one is an older one and the lighter colored one is kind of coming over and around the darker one? And if we take a look at this a little closer, here it is going into the forest. And if you look even closer, you can see the hot lava, molten lava right here flowing into the forest. And it does a very interesting thing, something that I'm sure you would never have figured that this lava would do. When the lava hits a tree, 
it will burn off where it hits the trunk. The top of the tree will then fall back on the surface of the lava, but the surface of the lava is solid and rather cool, and the tree doesn't burn up, most of the time anyway. So look at all those dead tree tops that are just there laying on the lava. So the lava goes around the trunk of the tree, and particularly in a wet environment like Hawaii is over on this side of Hawaii, the tree trunks are wet and the lava tends to chill right around the tree trunk. And what this does is make a mold of the tree trunk. So in this particular location, you can see that there was a big tree. Well, actually, okay, it was that big, it wasn't so huge. But there's the, a hole for scale. You can see a road up in the left there. So this is only about five or six feet high. And then if you get to the top of this and look down in, you can see the hole where the tree was and actually a few feet away, there was the tree that was still there, burned off. So these are called tree molds. And once again, another way to get a hole in basalt. See, that's our topic tonight, holy basalt. Another way to get a hole. I'm just having kind of fun with this. So anyway, there's gas holes, that puts a hole in the basalt. There's lava tubes, that gives you some big holes in the basalt. There's tree molds. And you know, this also leads to the top of talk of geos. Did you know that gas holes in lava flows can get mineralized many times with amethyst and you'll have these beautiful crystal filled holes. And one way to get them is to have gas holes in basalt. And what about lava tubes? You've seen those big cathedrals of amethyst. Many come from Brazil. They're weathered out lava flows. And the lava gets weathered, but the quartz that's on the inside is stronger and uh, it holds up. You can take it out of the mine and cut it. So geodes can come from these openings. So anyway, what is basalt? I'm not sure how much you know about geology, but um, it's lava, it's the most common rock on Earth, and I have a puzzle for you. It's the most common rock on Earth, but not often seen. It's not seen that often. Why is that? How can it be the most common rock on Earth, but not often seen? Do you know? Because it is under the ocean. The ocean crust is made up of lava. But of course, whoever sees the ocean crust, it's under the ocean. It's also under sediment. That's under the ocean. See, so we don't see lava as much as we ought to because it's under the ocean. So another reason why we're lucky here in uh, Holyoke, right? So where can you get holy basalt? Let's say you want your own holy basalt. Where can you get it? Did you know that you can get it at landscaping stores? And it only costs you $169 per cubic yard. That's a deal, right? Wow. So, you can also come to my Hawaii or Iceland tours and you can get some holy basalt there. Or, you can just go up to Goat Peak <laughs> and you can find some holy basalt up there as well. You can go up to the Holyoke Range, of course. So, I have a quick advertisement here. Yes, folks, how would you like to go to Iceland? There I am, it's July, I'm sitting on an iceberg. Oh, what a cool place to go. So I'm going back to Iceland this year, but that trip is full, but we're doing it again in 2020. So if you want to come, save your money up. Iceland's getting expensive, sorry to say, but we've got a great trip to Iceland. Northern California, as you can see, we're going to Scotland next year and also Death Valley and Yellowstone. So if you wish more information, you can either contact me later or pick up one of those sheets over there to my left. Now, for today, there's books. Um, on the creation of the valley, Dinosaurs and Dunes book for only $15, DVDs for $5 each, and there's a special tonight that you haven't heard about until just now. The DVDs are now two for ten. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go back to the show. So tonight's program, we're going to look at some basic concepts, some geologic time, the rock cycle, geography, the origins of the bedrock. We've got to make the mountains, and then we've got to erode them and look at the glacial history as well. Really interesting glacial history. What about this water gap anyway? How do we get the river through the Holyoke Range? How does that happen? And what about Lake Hitchcock? So let's go and explore a little bit further. Today's major point, this will be your exam question before you leave tonight. What was the major point of his talk? 
This is the best place in the world to study geology. Yes, the best place in the world to study geology. There's only three ways you can make rocks. Did you know that? Only three ways to make rocks is igneous rocks that, that once molten, the metamorphic ones from heat and pressure, and I always forget the third one. What is that? Oh yeah, okay. Can you say it louder? Boy, I usually get more of a response from that question. <laughs> but indeed, it's sedimentary. So rocks that were once pieces, parts of all those other rocks that were eroded into pieces. Sedimentary it is. Now, these are related into a rock cycle. How many people know all this stuff? You know, the Earth is a great recycling system. You've heard about this before, maybe? Anyone had Geo 101? Anybody want to admit they had Geo 101? Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, this is really, I mean, this is so interesting about the Earth, the fact that everything is recycled. But we start with rocks that were molten, and they can be molten in two ways, basically. You can be a magma deep in the Earth's crust, or it could be squeezed up to the surface and become lava. And the reason why I want to mention that just a little bit here is that the magma that's slow cooled deep in the Earth's crust, perhaps a million years to cool, all the elements are going to come together into minerals, and the minerals can get rather large because they have a million years to do it. If you have the liquid coming up to the surface as lava, it's going to cool really quickly, and you don't, don't have the time for crystallization like you do as a magma chamber. So what does it mean in terms of a rock? Well, if you have time to crystallize, you're going to get something such as a granite, and everybody knows how pretty granite is, right? Different colors, you can see the crystals, just beautiful. But if it cools fast and you get a lava, it's basalt. We'll see more pictures of basalt, but I'm going to hold this up and say, isn't that just an ugly rock? <laughs> yeah, it's an ugly brown or gray rock. It doesn't have a lot of character. But it's got pretty good meaning. I mean, if you know what it is, it was the lava and it's 201 million years old. Now, if you pick this up, you will see some crystals here, but that's only because there was a crack, a fault line in the basalt and some minerals came in, some groundwater came through and with minerals and filled it in. So that's actually not part of the real rock that came in later. Okay, so <clears throat> that's the igneous category. And then all rocks are going to erode. So when you erode, you get sediments, and the sediments become layered rocks, sedimentaries. And then if there's a collision of continents, you're going to squeeze up all the pre-existing rocks into mountain ranges, perhaps, and you're going to get metamorphic rocks. And if it heats up enough, it'll be melted, and you'll go back to magma again. See, so you have this really neat cycling of everything on Earth. And that, of course, is the rock cycle. Okay, I already talked about this here, but the magma cooling rate, extrusive versus intrusive, that's what's really important in, in these beautiful rocks that we find. If it slow cools, it's going to be larger minerals like granite. If it fast cools, it's going to be small minerals, extrusive uh, types of igneous rocks. If the example is basalt. So basalt, don't see the minerals to any great degree. Granite, minerals easily seen, all due to the rate of cooling. So, let's take a look at this once again. The major point, the best place in the world to study geology, right here. So, what's the proof of this? Well, look at what we have here across the valley. We have dinosaur footprints in sedimentary rocks. We've got a lava flow. We've got the river. We've got the old Lake Hitchcock. Oh, we've got the dinosaur. There it goes. Hmm. So there's so much here that's quite exciting. If we look at the details for the Holyoke Range area, we have these lava flows that are in the valley, and sometimes there's dikes and sills, as it says. Now, you should know that a dike is liquid rock magma that pushes through other layers to go across them in some sense. And when it crosses them, that's its geometry. It's called a dike. Now, the other thing that could happen as the, as the lava, the magma is coming through, it could, could go between layers, like sliding your hand between the pages of a book, and that's called a sill. So dikes and sills are found here in the Holyoke Range. 
as well as flows. So we've got everything here. We've got dikes, we've got sills, we've got lava flows. Of course, the lava flow is the big thing because the Holyoke Range itself is, um, as you see the arrow here, it's mainly a lava flow. Okay, we have our dinosaur footprints. Now the dinosaur footprints can be found as you see the arrows here on top, the layer of rock on top of the lava, which is off to the left there, and not so much in the layers of rock that are underneath the Holyoke Range. It seems that the climate is better and the dinosaurs are here much more numerous and in the rocks that are off to the top of the lava, younger than the lava flow. Now, here's some essential bedrock details. If you would like to find out what the rock is underneath your house, there's a website you can go to, and it's on the handout today. But let me just tell you, if you just Google Geological Map Massachusetts, you'll come up with this site. And then you can zoom in closer and closer and closer and closer until you get your street in your house, and you will get a series of colors, a color that will be the rock type that's under your house or wherever you want to look. And then you can click on that and there will be a pop-up box that will tell you about that rock. Now there will be a bunch of words there that you will not understand because they're too detailed, but ignore those and you will get a lot of information about the rock type, the age, and some of the minerals that are in it. It's a very, very useful um, technique here for finding out about what's where here. Oops. So uh, if we look a little closer, this is what we find here that these layers of rock to the right and the left of the valley itself, here's the Connecticut uh, Valley, the Central Valley, with sedimentary rocks in the lava flow, more about that in a minute, but these rocks on either side, these are the metamorphic rocks that were formed when Pangaea collided. But I'm going to skip by that story tonight because we've got a lot to talk about with the Holyoke Range, but I just want to put this in perspective that we did have this big collision between continents and there's a lot of metamorphic rocks all around thanks to that great squeezing as Pangaea was created. So that happened in the Paleozoic era. So if you put your, your hands side to side like this, here's the geological time scale. We'll pretty much forget the Precambrian and go directly to the Paleozoic. So the Paleozoic is the time for creating Pangaea. And that goes roughly 600 million years ago to about 250 million years ago. But once again, I just wanted to state that we really want to get uh, to the Mesozoic here coming up next. So I just have to press the right button on the computer here. So in the Paleozoic, we create Pangaea. Just in case you have trouble remembering this time scale and this sequence of events, remember Paleozoic starts with P and so does Pangaea. So Paleozoic, Pangaea, Pangaea, Paleozoic. That's what happens there. And with the collision, we make the Appalachian Mountains. And of course, we're living amongst the bases, the base, the eroded base of those old mountains. And now we get to the Mesozoic Valley. This is going to come next. The Mesozoic era is next. So when we get to the Mesozoic, Pangaea is going to split. And this gives us our valley. There's three time periods that are in the Mesozoic era, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, and everybody of course has heard of the Jurassic. So we're splitting Pangaea, and as Pangaea splits, lots of lava comes up through the whole series of cracks as we are splitting this big supercontinent. And here in our valley, there's a whole bunch of cracks by the way. You don't, when you crack a continent, you don't just get one crack. There's a whole bunch of cracks all up and down the East Coast, but the biggest one is where the Atlantic Ocean came in. So we are, of course, 100 miles to the west of the Atlantic Ocean, and we are in our own valley. We have our own crack here. It's called the Eastern Border Fault, and it goes from New Haven all the way to Keene. And Holyoke is uh, not too far away. We're kind of in the middle of the valley here, so the crack is on the other side of the river. But... Um, we're in this early valley, and this is what it would have looked like. So, <clears throat> the crack is a rift valley. There are mountains on one side, there's a fault line, and the mountains get eroded and everything, the sediments, wash into the valley. 
So as they wash into the valley, they create these alluvial fans, piles of gravel piled up against the mountain shorelines and lake beds. This is a, de a picture from Death Valley, so it shows you the same landscape as we would have had here in the Mesozoic. And the rocks that you find around the Holyoke Range probably look, well, would look just like this. You've seen these, these types of things, I'm sure, as you've walked around. There are piles of gravel that represent stream deposits of the old alluvial fans. And there are sandstones that represent the old shorelines and lake beds. And if it's finer, like muddy, you'll get the shales. The knife is six inches just for scale. And you see that the shales were mud. And when the lake dried up here, there were mud cracks. And you can see here those uh, lines. And rain also came down and impacted in the wet mud. So those are raindrop impressions. So how about that? There's a weather forecast from 200 million years ago. It rained, the sun came out, we got mud cracks. And so, um, Mount Tom and the Holyoke Range, you can see here. There, the story of that is coming up next. Uh, so, let's just go through this here. Um, we got the Rift Valley. We have the sediments coming into the Rift Valley, and also we have this lava that's coming out. So after the sediment comes into the base of the valley, we have lava that comes out across the valley. There's a couple of lava flows. The Holyoke one is about 600 feet thick, so that's a really thick lava flow. And it's going to go all the way from our area, all the way through um, Connecticut as well. But there's a smaller flow that's up in the Deerfield Greenfield area, which you can see there, the brown color. So we had a, lot, a smaller flow there as well. Uh, you might know Mount Sugarloaf, that is not sedimentary, uh, excuse me, that's not igneous, it's sedimentary just under the lava. Here's a map of Connecticut and it shows you that red stripe there, that's the Holyoke Range lava, goes all the way to New Haven, it's offset by some faulting here, so that's why it looks pretty complicated, but it's really one lava flow, but the lava flow is tilted, that's why it looks like a stripe, and I'm going to get to that story very, very soon. A closer look at the Holyoke Range. Well, it looks like a hockey stick basically, and as we get to the point of the hockey stick, the end of the hockey stick, there's particularly right there, there's all those black lines. Those black lines are fault lines. So you see, one of the reasons why the Holyoke Range is kind of wrenched around like a hockey stick and not just um, straight is because of some stresses that faulted that edge of the range and wrenched it around, as you see, giving it an east-west trend. So if you look at the um, actual rock units that are part of the Holyoke Range, you can see these listed on the handout tonight. I'm not going to go over these, but it's a lot of lava and sedimentary rocks on either side of it. There's also some explosive stuff called tuff. So volcanoes were erupting nearby to give us it, what's called the Gramby Tuff, and the Tuff is fragments that were blown out of volcanic vents. So this is just the Google Earth picture. So what did it actually look like? Well, if we were here at this time, it would be much like Iceland. See, because Iceland is pulling apart on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And the eruptions in Iceland, I'm sure you've seen pictures of them. There's some great ones that are online. But they're fissure flows, also known as flood basalts. Lots of lava is coming out. It's hot. It's fluid. It's spattering up in certain places. But there are no big volcanoes over most of Iceland. You see a landscape like this over most of Iceland. Now, there are some big volcanoes, but over most of Iceland there's a lot of fissure flows, and this is what our valley would have looked like, uh, perhaps without the bus. <laughs> 200 million years ago you would have walked across the flat landscape of a lot of fissure flows. Now, the er eruptive cones along, along the cracks where the lava comes out, there, there are places that spatter upward and the spatter makes a cone, and guess what, it's called a spatter cone. And so you'd see these 20 or 30 or 40 foot high spatter cones that you can hike up. But no big volcanoes, and I think that may be a misconception that a lot of people have. Lava is volcanic, 
but it doesn't have to come out of a volcano. It can come out of a crack. And that's what we have here. The fissure is where these uh, flows issue from, and they're called fissure flows or flood basalts. So, um, yeah, we're uh, looking at, uh, I think that's Mount Hood in the background, um, but I'm not exactly sure, but it came from out west, and I took this picture from someplace else. Didn't actually take it myself. So, um, and anyway, I would like to point out that no big volcanoes, because if we had big volcanoes, if there were big volcanoes here, they're, they're 200 million years old, they would be eroded now. And when volcanoes get eroded, the middle part is what is more resistant to erosion than the surface flows in the volcanic ash. So that tends to be eroded away, and it's the middle core, the neck of the volcano, that gets um, preserved on the landscape like Shiprock here in New Mexico. So take a look at that. There's the neck of the volcano. And you know we have these radiating lava pieces that come out here. Those are dikes. And this is what happened. May I please explain exactly why you get those because they're pretty interesting. When there's going to be an eruption, the magma is coming up out of the earth. It's going to make the volcano swell and stretch. It's kind of like that spicy spaghetti I had a few days ago. <laughs> Swelling, stretching, okay, I didn't split. But the volcano, when you get the eruption, is going to swell and stretch and split. The magma comes up and it follows those crack lines outward. And that's preserved within the volcano. And when it comes out to the side of the volcano, you get a lava flow. But when the volcano gets eroded, you see, it's those dikes that stick up that are pretty resistant and they give you a landscape pattern like this of these radiating dikes. But it's all due to the pressure, the upward pressure of the eruption. Okay, let's take a look at basalt columns. These are not crystals like many people think. It's, these are just shrinkage cracks due to the cooling of the lava. So the lava comes out liquid, it cools, it shrinks, you get a crack. It cracks in roughly a five or six sided pattern and these propagate down through the uh, lava flow and are then exposed by erosion. So here are some examples in the Holyoke range that you were just were looking at there. So um, this is almost right under the summit house. You see these cracks, these basalt columns. Now here's some from Washington State. You see these very, very commonly in all volcanic areas. This is a famous one from Iceland that makes it into most of the geology textbooks. And if you go back to the Holyoke Range, if you pick up a basalt, they're sometimes called jingle stones because they, the crystals are intergrown. And if you can have a couple of thinner pieces of basalt and tap them together, they will jingle. You'll make some rock music. How many people have done that? Okay, you know what I'm talking about. It really works. So, what happens when lava flows underwater? Well, this is a photoshopped uh, picture here. This family is not really standing on this little lava bench. And by the way, don't ever do this. <laughs> and the reason is not what you think. You think, oh my gosh, the lava is going to come and kill me. But no, that's not it. You see that water there? What if the water wasn't there? you would be standing on the edge of a cliff that might be three or four hundred feet directly under you. And what is supporting that? Well, the lava is coming into the ocean and it's spattering. It's not making a really good foundation there. So these benches routinely fall off and sometimes it brings people with them. So don't do this. So they Photoshop these people in here. So why am I showing you this picture? Well, we had lakes in the Connecticut Valley. There were lakes here when the lava was flowing out. So when the Holyoke Range lavas were flowing out, sometimes they flowed into lakes, not the ocean. They make something called pillows, pillow lava. Now here are some pictures off of Hawaii, underwater of course, and you can see this guy standing by um, a, a big projection that's just kind of coming out towards him. And there's some other ones up there. They look like round balls in the picture, but they're actually like tubes because the lava squeezes out that way underwater. And at the risk of seeming very foolish here, let me show you how this happens with a little hand demonstration. Okay, my hand and arm, this is a lava flow underwater. 
right? There's a lava flow underwater. Now, underwater, it's going to chill the surface. So that's all solid. But on the inside, it is still liquid. And it's still pushing against the front of that lava flow. And it is going to crack and squirt forward. And then again, and again, and again, and again. Each one of these is a squirt that came out of that lava flow underwater. So it advances by a series of squirts that then cool, crack, and have their own spurt out the end. And they make a series of pillows. Well, into water, you get pillows. On land, you get columns. And now, with that information, you have your test this afternoon, this evening, because I'm going to show you some pictures and see if you can tell whether this is a surface lava flow in the Holyoke Range showing columns, or is it a place where the liquid lava went into a lake here in the Holyoke Range? So I did want to note that these lakes are not Lake Hitchcock because that's the Glacial Age Lake which came 200 million years later. My students are always getting that wrong and they just missed the correct answer by 200 million. That's all. Okay, uh, diagram of pillows. I don't know, I like my demonstration better. Uh, I, I thought I should show you some examples of pillows here. So you've seen examples of columns. There's a place in Greenfield where the lava just shows pillows quite nicely. And you can see this here uh, on the left. That's the edge of one of those pillows. And it's, it's a great example because when you take lava that's about 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit and you put it into water, it's going to chill very quickly. And that chilled surface looks a bit like a pastry. See, look at that chilled, cracked surface. And then if you can crack the edge off, you see the tube shape and there's uh, some vesicles in there also, the red pen stuck in a vesicle. And just to show you another example, this one is out by Goat Peak. Do you guys know where that is? Do you know where Goat Peak is? And I bet you've climbed up the steel tower there at Goat Peak. And I'm sure you never noticed this because this is not a textbook example. But this uh, young lady is pointing to basalt here. So that is basalt. And if you take a look at the general surface, do you think there are little round shapes there or are there column shapes? See that? See that? And some other ones there? They're definitely roundish. Like I say, this is not a textbook example, but those are pillows. And you can see them just as you start to climb uh, towards the tower from the trail. So. Please note that there are no columns, so this is where the Holyoke lavas flowed into a shallow lake. Those are pillows. Convinced? Maybe? Okay. Now, th there's another ringer here that you should realize. Something else can go wrong in your interpretation, because rock weathering will also produce spheroidal shapes that might be confused with pillows. And there was a friend of mine that said, oh, look, I found this great outcrop. Um, along a trail um, over near the, the log cabin. So I hiked over there to see this, and boy, I said, ah, oh, boy, they, they, those really look like pillows when you look at them. But when you get a little bit closer, and you look at the back side of the rock, um, you see that there's a lot of cracks here that are very angular. They're not a pillow shape, and you didn't have quite the right structure. So there's a close-up of the back side. So, so these are just weathered columns. The columns are tipped over on their side, and they're weathered off into roundish shapes. Uh, this one here also is very, very puzzling because doesn't those, don't those look like pillows? Mm -hmm. But it's the same rock all the way along. It's just weathering into those shapes. So this is just a weathering phenomenon, spheroidal weathering. It's not a pillow. Pillows have... Uh, air bubbles, and then they have a definite rim around them. They don't just grade out into the next rock with uh, next part of the rock with no change. What so, about a glassy uh, texture on the outside? Would that happen? The, the glassy texture used to be there, but it devitrifies. It turns to um, uh, just, uh, just a uh, 
just a stone basically. So yeah, I mean if you're in Hawaii you would see glassy surfaces because of quick cooling. You're all familiar with obsidian perhaps, a rock glass from quick cooling. So the outside of lava flows that get cooled quickly like in Hawaii, they have a lot of that glassy surface. But 200 million year old lava loses the glassiness. It uh, hydrates and you just don't see the glassiness anymore. Okay, we're going to test your interpretive skill. Here we are on the summit trail, the halfway house trail up to the summit of, um, the, well, the summit house there, Mount Holyoke. And let's take a look at this. What do you think? The arrows show you the contact between sedimentary rock underneath and the lava. So the lava is right on top. This is the contact line, the sedimentary rocks, layered sedimentary rocks underneath. What do you think? Is it going to be pillows or columns? Columns, absolutely. Yes, you see the column shapes. Okay. And now we have a weathering and erosion joke here. Now, it's hard to find a weathering joke. Let's see what you think of this one. Okay. Forget about finding the mother load, Bessie. This outcrop's going to make us rich. And so that is supposed to be Elvis, just in case you don't remember what Elvis looked like. Looks more like Ricky Nelson. <laughs> I, I think so, also. Yes, I, I think it does, yes. Okay, let's take a look at some more rocks. How are you doing? Good. Yeah. More rocks, more rocks. Here we go. Now, there's the summit hut, of course. And we're all used to seeing basalt looking, or the rocks around here looking kind of brownish like this. But when you break them open, you see that they actually have a different color on the inside. That's the true color of the rock. It's a gray or almost black color. But there's enough iron in basalts so they always get weathered to a brownish, reddish surface on the outside. Now, another thing. This is not basalt. If you take a look closely at this rock, once again, from the summit house, it was exposed in the wall there, but it is found in, the, in that area. Look at all the crystals in here. See all the crystals? Okay. But basalt doesn't have crystals that you can easily see because it cools too fast. So this is a rock. Oh, I hope I put the name in. Did I put the name in? Yes, I did. It's called gabbro, otherwise known as a black granite. And a gabbro is a rock that has the minerals that cool deep in the ground and cool slowly. But they came up probably as like a, an oatmeal mush that came up within, with the eruption and cooled and formed a coarse crystalline rock as opposed to the, the really tiny crystals of a basalt. So here's your basalt. Now if you do any reading about geology in the area, another word that's used is called diabase. And I hate all these different terms, but it's really just a basalt that's got a little bit larger minerals in it that you can barely see. I would just call it basalt. Okay, can you see the contact between the basalt and the underlying sedimentary rock? We're on the road to the summit house here. And once again, powers of observation. Can you tell where the basalt is and where the sedimentary rock is? Okay, make a mental note because here it comes. The answer <laughs> is right there. Okay, now looking closer, pillows or columns? Columns once again, yes. So it's kind of hard to find good pillowed areas in the Holyoke Range around here. Uh, you can find it down in Connecticut. I've seen some nice pillows in Connecticut. And the lava flow in Greenfield has some really nice ones in certain areas there. But um, the Holyoke Range itself in our area doesn't have a lot of pillows. Now let's take a look at these holes in the rock. Remember our title, Holy Basalt? Look at this. There's a hole. I stuck a leaf in it just so you can see how far it goes. It goes right through that sample. It's called a pipe stem vesicle. So the pipe stem is really an interesting vesicle shape because you can measure these, you can plot these and figure out which way the lava flowed. Here's the deal on this. If there's an air bubble that's coming up through the lava, just like bubbles in your soda when you take the top off, the bubble goes towards the surface. Now in a lava flow, as it's rising slowly towards the surface, the lava is also moving. And so the bubble can get stretched in the direction 
of the lava flow. So if you're a geology student or professor and studying the direction of lava flows, you can measure the direction, the angle that the vesicles are pointing. And when you do enough of those, you can figure out which way the lava was flowing. So anyway, that's a pipe stem vesicle. And it's got a good story. Okay, and finally, fossil earthquakes. And are you still awake? <laughs> Let's go to the Mount Tom Quarry. Do you folks all know where that is, perhaps? Okay, the Mount Tom Quarry, just around the bend. Well, look at these. This broken rock there, besides just having the lava that flowed out with a lot of the features we've just talked about, Sometimes the rock is all broken and then re-cemented back together. Breccia means broken. And so these are zones that are all broken. Well, what's going to break several hundred feet of lava? Well, it's going to be an earthquake. So the earthquakes have cracked certain areas of the lava and made these zones. And the zones make a rock that are very, very pretty. So these are breccia zones. And this is a very interesting breccia zone. Sometimes they're filled with minerals and are very, very colorful. But here, this is a sandy filling. So the lava broke, but it was close enough to the surface that sand washed down into all those cracks. But did it come from above or below? Now you may think that, who cares? We got sand in a crack. Who cares whether it came from above or below? <laughs> but, I got to tell you my reasoning here, because if you look at earthquakes, you, do you know about the, the sand blows, the little sand geysers, uh, mud volcanoes they're called sometimes? The, the pressure of the groundwater underneath will come up along fault lines, and you'll have these little mud, mud geysers that will come up. And so I thought, when I first found this, that the quake happened, and it um, excited the the groundwater system underneath, and therefore we had sand coming up from below making a geyser here in the valley. And I thought, oh, that would be cool. We had these mud geysers coming up, and there's the evidence. Well, one of my colleagues from Columbia University, who was a guy who's just amazing at finding fossils, this guy has a career of finding fossils all over the place. His name is uh, Paul Olson. So Paul Olson found similar things in New Jersey because there's the Palisades. You all heard of the Palisades, I think. The Palisades is a lava just like our lava with one big difference. It's a sill. It didn't actually make it to the surface. So it came in between sedimentary layers, but it's a very, th I think it's almost a thousand feet thick. So it's a very thick pile of lava that came in there. But instead of making it to the surface, it went between the layers, and it's a very thick sill. So he's investigating the basalt there in the Hudson Valley, and he found these same things. And guess what? He found rodent bones in the sand fill. Rodent bones had washed down from the surface. So this wasn't a geyser from below. Apparently, it was washed down. Now, there's a detail that is really a detail, right? <laughs> but anyway, they came from above, apparently. So now let's get to something that happens besides breaking rocks. When you have an earthquake, you can break the rocks, but you can also get a sliding along the fault. And as you go with your hands like this, as I know you've done this winter, uh, maybe even this spring, maybe coming into the summer, you'll be doing this. You are generating heat, heat because of friction. When you have the Earth's crust together, and then there's an earthquake, and you have a slip along that fault, you are generating a tremendous amount of friction along that fault that can even melt that surface. It will be melted, and it will also be scratched by the movement. It's something that we call a slick inside, or slick side here. And take a look at this piece. You can see all the lines on it, and there's some minerals that came in after the faulting. Minerals will tend to come along those cracks. So, a fossil earthquake. The minerals that come into these cracks, they crystallize within the cracks, and when the space to crystallize, that's how you get crystals. Right? Crystals need space to grow. And so the Connecticut Valley is a great place to find minerals, and collectors are here quite a bit getting all sorts of things. So, 
the spaces that get filled are not only along the fault lines, but they're also in the holes, the vesicles. Now I told you, you're going to learn more. Did I tell you this? You're going to learn more than you ever wanted to know about, the, about basalt. So here's a detail that is really pretty exciting, I think, because those used to be holes. See all those little white circles? Those used to be open holes. But given time, groundwater comes through and it brings minerals into holes. And if you've got 200 million years, all the holes that were here in the basalt have been filled. So when you see open holes in today's basalt, it has been, these have been dissolved out. So they were filled and now they're empty because they got dissolved. So minerals can come in and fill those holes, but as it says here, uh, you can also get minerals in the magma chamber just coming up with the lava, and that's the source of these crystals here. So there's two origins for some of these crystals that you find in the Connecticut Valley in basalts. So, and a couple of names. Once again, if you want to get an A in this course, you have to determine whether the mineral that you find in a basalt came in from the magma chamber or did it come in from groundwater or hydrothermal solutions, hot water solutions, and crystallize into a vesicle? How are you going to tell? It's easy. This is angular. It's a crystal that came up in the magma chamber. Vesicles are typically roundish. So if you take a vesicle and fill it like a little geode, they're going to be round. And it's going to be different minerals also because the minerals from magma chambers are not the same ones with the same compositions that come in with groundwater. See, so it's really pretty easy to tell. But the terminology is typical of what you would expect in college, right? The ones that are the filling of air bubbles, they're called amygdules. And the ones that come up from the magma chamber are called phenocrysts, big crystals. So if you have a uh, basalt with filled air bubbles, you have an amygdaloidal basalt, just to let you know. Here we go. Make, we got to make the mountains here. So now we're going to find out how we get this ridge sticking up. You all know that it's a lava flow by now, right? We all got that down. But lavas don't flow up on edges like this. They flow out flat. They're a flood. It's a flood basalt. It's a fissure flow. So they came out flat. But now we have to make the mountains because the mountains are tilted. And when they're tilted, there's a cliff on one side that's just because it's eroded. It's eroded away. But there's something called a dip slope because in geology, when something is tilted, we say that it's dipping. And so if you take anything in geology and make it tilted, it will tend to erode and have a steeper slope on one side, the cliff side, and then there'll be the dip slope controlled by the tilt of the layer on the other side. And that's just what we have here in the Holyoke Range. So there's our basalt lava flow. It's tilted. So how did this all happen? The lava comes out flat, but we're in this rift valley. Remember Pangea is pulling apart? And when Pangea pulls apart, there was this major fault called the Eastern Border Fault, and it went down, as you can see, the arrow. If the lava comes out flat in the valley, and the sedimentary layers here as well, sedimentary layers and the lava, they come out flat, but because of the movement of the eastern border fault, it's going to be tilted. Now, we use the sandwich here as uh, an example, because as we take a look at the sandwich, this is much like geologic processes here. Deposition of the lower bun, that happened first. Then the next layer, next layer, next layer. See, you get this whole stacking. That's geology. <laughs> so there's uh, various um, sedimentary layers here, the New Haven Formation it's called, and then we have the lava that's in the middle, that's the Holyoke Range, then there's more sediments on top called the East Berlin Formation, and then actually we have another lava flow, a shorter one, um, and there's also dikes and sills related to that one, but it's much thinner than the, than the Holyoke Basalt. But that's going to be the tomatoes. And then there's more sediments on top. And I really like these buns because you can actually see the sediments. See, there they are right there. <laughs> see the pieces? Pieces? That makes sediments. OK. Now, take our sandwich. And there's an eastern border fault that's going to tilt the whole sandwich. So this valley is a tilted sandwich thanks to the eastern border fault. So what are we going to do next to make our valley? We are 
going to erode it. Now this is a very important geological concept here. When you get erosion, hard rocks will resist erosion and they'll, they'll make hills, they'll make mountains, they'll make high areas. So this is a universal truth. If you're on a hill, there can be some examples that won't quite fit that, but um, if you're on a bedrock hill anyway, you are on a resistant rock. And the stronger that rock is, the higher it will be above the surrounding landscape because most of our landscape is due to erosion and things that resist erosion stand up higher. So that's one basic um, concept you should know here. So what is the hardest thing in this sandwich? It's going to be the lava of the Holyoke Range. So that's going to stick up if you take a look at the blue line here. So we have Mount Tom that's going to be on top of this. There's going to be a cliff on this side in East Hampton and related places on, on our geography will be over that away. <laughs> and then we come down here towards the river and we'll be over to South Hadley. Now, what if we never had the tilt? What if we just had this geology without the eastern border fault, without the Rift Valley? If our rocks were still flat, we'd have this type of landscape like you see out west commonly. If they were slightly tilted, you would see slightly tilted mesas called coestas here. And if they're steeper, they're called hogbacks. So we are on a hogback type of landscape. Now I must say, I've never been on a hog's back. I really don't know of why they call these things hogbacks. Anyone have a hog? <laughs> but when they stick up at more than, a, well, about a 45 degree angle, you know, they're called a, a hogback as opposed to a coester or a mesa that's flat. So that's what we have here. We have tilted rocks, then they get eroded, then they stick up with a cliff side because of the erosion and the dips um, on the other side there, the, the dip slope. Let's go to the end of the Mesozoic and make the landscape flat. So you just saw how we had the landscape today, but we're going to go back in time to when the Rift Valley had stopped rifting and it had totally filled in and had been eroded right across the top. And you can see this in the structure right here. So we had the Rift Valley had stopped faulting, it had filled in, it had tilted, and then it had been eroded. It was part of a very large scale erosion surface called a peanut plain. So across the whole region, the landscape was flat. And so we had this peanut plain landscape. And then as we come towards the present day, perhaps 20 to 12 million years ago, there's a regional uplift, and any time you uplift the land, rivers can now downcut. So they downcut, and remember the rocks that are hard? Once the rivers start to downcut, the hard rocks are going to stand up high. So perhaps over the past 12 million years, this has been happening. Now this is probably a very new concept for you, but you see the Peony Plain landscape here in this picture. Remember, that was a flat landscape that goes back at least 12, maybe 20 million years ago. Look at the background of this picture, looking up towards Vermont. And you can see that there is a flat line, if you can, uh, I don't have a pointer and my arm is not quite big enough to show you that, but can you see the flat surface all the way in the background? Okay, on the horizon there? Well, that was the approximate level of the Earth, like I say, 20 or so million years ago. And then it uplifted. How much did it uplift? Well, peanut plains are graded to sea level. So this land was roughly at sea level 20 million years ago, and it has been uplifted, well, how much? Well, how high is that surface up in the hills? Anybody come down from the hill towns tonight? 600 feet. Uh, actually, it's over that. It's, it's about 1,000 or 1,200 or 1,400 up there. Yeah, so we, we've got at least 1,000 feet of uplift, which means the rivers have a lot to work on, and glaciers a little bit later, to work on to erode things to, to the landscape that we see today. So anyway, you can see some of these features here, about 1,200 feet. The Holyoke Range top is about 800 feet, even though the perspective makes it look as high as the background. Here's a structure of a valley. 
Uh, this diagram is similar to the Holyoke Range. It just shows you the Greenfield lavas here. It's called the Deerfield Basalt. And I want to show you how this is going to uh, develop here. So the erosion surface, the old Peony Plain, is around 1,200 feet. And the Holyoke Range top, as you can see, is about 800 feet. So let's see how much we're going to get eroded. In 12 million years, roughly, we're going to erode that much rock. So how much is that? Remember, the hard rock sticks up. We're going to erode the whole top. So let's see what this is going to work out to be. If the Holyoke Range top is 800 feet and the, the uplands there is at 1,200 feet, um, we have 500 feet to erode in 12 million years. And of course, these numbers are not exact. This is kind of crappy math, but let's just see what we get. So take 500 feet. 500 feet is actually 6,000 inches. But of course, I know you knew that. Boy, everybody's asleep. That was a little joke. You didn't know that it was 6,000 inches, did you? <laughs> okay, so we have 6,000 inches. Now, inches per year, it's going to work out to be about um, one-tenth of a sheet of paper per year, one sheet of paper per decade. So anyway, that gives you some idea of the erosion rates to make the landscape as we see it today. You know, a sheet of paper per decade is going to be eroded away and will eventually get the landscape that we see here. Now, this is really a very rough estimate because glacial erosion did a lot more work than the general river erosion did, so the rates would be a lot faster when the glacier is scraping through here. Okay, how about the origin of the water gap? Let's get the river through the ridge. And you see, understanding this Peony Plain time is essential here because we have to make the landscape flat. When the landscape's flat, do we have the Holyoke range? No. The landscape's flat. So without the range, the river can just go right over the top of the flat land all the way to the ocean. And so the lavas you see are down underneath here, kind of hidden below that surface where the river's flowing. Then we have the uplift, as you now know about. So when we have the uplift, the river can now cut down through the Holyoke Range because it started above there on the old Peony Plain level. This diagram shows you this. So we start out with the Peony Plain level, the river is just flowing, and then we have uplift, the river is up there anyway, and then it starts to down cut, and then the surroundings also erode because they're softer rock and the river finds itself on top of the range cutting through it because it started way up there on the old Peony Plain level. So if we take a look next here, how about this question here? When I first came to the valley, people told me that, well, we have the only east-west mountain range in the world. Has anyone else ever heard that? That they're saying, oh my god, the only east-west mountain range in the world. But the United States. Okay, well, even that's... Okay, yes, they told me the world, and I said, gee, there, there is the Himalayas, you know. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, so, I, I will say that this is completely an overstated fact, because what we have here is a ridge. We have a ridge of lava, and that ridge of lava has been kind of jerked around at that edge that goes east-west, because that's over near the fault. Remember the Rift Valley? Okay. The fault that made the Rift Valley not only dropped the valley down, but it also wrenched it sideways a bit. And when you take a look at the geology here, okay, so there it is. Here's that eastern border fault. And here's where the faults have been mapped on the Holyoke Range. So here's our Holyoke Basalt. And so we come over to here and boom, 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 boom. You see, this range has been pulled this way as well as dropped. And so there's a little bit of distortion there that gives us that east-west section. So it's an interesting thing to recognize but not make such a big deal out of. <laughs> okay, let's look at the ice ages quickly. The last ice age was at its maximum only 20,000 years ago. 20,000, like wow, we've been talking millions of years here. Now it's only 20,000. So the ice sheet spread out as everybody knows. But imagine standing on the Holyoke Range. There you are. You're on the crest of the Holyoke Range. Let me tell you, it's hard to get this picture. Yeah. So you're looking north. 
at the advancing glacier. Can you imagine that? The glacier's coming down from Canada. You're standing at Mount Tom there. You're standing at Mount Holyoke. You're looking at it coming down towards you. And guess what? It's got to go all the way to Long Island Sound. So that ice is going to come down and go right up and over the range. So the place that gets eroded most, the ice is going to go up and over the range. But remember all those faults that we just talked about a few minutes ago? Those are zones of weakness. So as the glacier is making its way up and over the range and flowing along, it will erode weaker areas along those cracks more than otherwise. And therefore, there's those peaks that are called the Seven Sisters. Those are the stronger rocks between the faults. So that's why we have the ups and downs of the Holyoke Range in that section. Then, when the ice finally melts away, there's a dam of glacial debris in uh, central Connecticut. And that dams up the, um, the Connecticut River Valley. So the melting water is trapped here within the valley. And so we get Glacial Lake Hitchcock. And so you can see that here. So um, as you look out across the valley, if you were here at this time looking out across the valley, you'd see the lake, you'd see the glacier. The glacier is melting away. And the lake is right there in, fr in front of the melting ice. And if you're up here on the range, you would have a great view of the surface of the lake. I mean, that's where the fancy hotel would be. And <laughs> the ships would come up the valley to the front of the ice, as you would see in this view here. Ah, what a time, just like Alaska. <laughs> and so we have kind of reached the end of our journey today. And you can kind of imagine Thomas Cole coming here and painting this wonderful landscape. In fact, uh, you know, he's, he's going to be right down here taking a, a look at the landscape. And you can imagine that he'd be saying, wow, this is the best place in the world to study geology. <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, now you know some of these amazing stories. And what has been seen cannot be unseen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I know I have talked a lot tonight for way too long, but I will take three questions and then we will break and I'll ask, answer other questions. And if you'd like to go and see anything else uh, that I brought with me tonight, please do that. But let me just take three quick questions at this point and then I'm going to let you go. Yes? What was the depth of Lake Hitchcock around Amherst? And would Amherst or that whole valley look like a lake with, with islands coming up, depending upon their elevation? Oh, yes. Uh, the, uh, the, that's a great question. There would be islands within the lake. Um, there's something called a drumlin. Drumlins are piles of glacial till created as the glacier is moving along. And Amherst, that area, has a bunch of drumlins. The drumlins would, up, would be above the surface of Lake Hitchcock. So, you would, you would find not only the Holyoke Range sticking up rather prominently, but there'd be smaller islands there as well. So yeah, there were some islands. And how deep the lake was is a really great question, because are you talking early in the lake history or late in the lake history? Because you know, lakes are muddy. So there's uh, at least um, 100 feet of clay underneath UMass at the playing fields there. So we know this, the shoreline of Lake Hitchcock because there are shoreline deposits and they turn out to be about 250 feet above sea level there in the Amherst area. And if you look at the elevation of the playing fields, you're somewhere right around 200 feet above sea level. So the lake was somewhere around 50 feet deep. Mm -hmm. um, but if you subtract 100 feet of clay, then the lake was 150 feet deep, you know, when it started. So that gives you a range. Okay, another question. Yes. Where was it blocked in Connecticut? Where was it blocked? Um, what happened? Yeah. Okay, that, that's another excellent question, and I'll make it quick. But do you know where Dinosaur State Park is? It's Rocky Hill, Connecticut. It's just south of Hartford. It's right along Route 91. A place you should all go, by the way, because I know you all love geology. But 
There's this world-class dinosaur footprint site, and it's called Dinosaur State Park now in Connecticut. Once again, Rocky Hill, just south of Hartford, and it's literally uh, five minutes from the interstate. So, wow, got the exit right there, go down the road. In that area is also the dam that created Lake Hitchcock. And the, the origin of that dam is something that, that you would never guess, so let me tell you, it'll save you a lot of guessing time. Here's the origin of the dam for Lake Hitchcock. There was an older lake called Lake Middletown, and there was uh, meltwater from the glacier coming into Lake Middletown and also from the sides of the lake, and it built a big delta of sand and gravel into Lake Middletown with the ice right there in the front. Well, that delta formed the dam for Lake Hitchcock because as the ice melted back, that delta gravel formed the dam. But I gotta give you one more fact here because how strong is delta gravel for a, making a 4,000 year dam? You know, it's not strong at all. You can shovel that right away, water seeps through it. It's a terrible dam material. It's a damn terrible material. <laughs> so the thing that creates Lake Hitchcock besides that actual blockage is the fact that as the water level rose, it found an outlet through New Britain, not Rocky Hill, but through New Britain, Connecticut, on bedrock. It found an outlet that happened to have rock to flow over. So there was a beautiful engineered spillway right there that didn't erode for 4,000 years until the dam gave way. But um, it's an interesting story. Thanks for asking that question. And now, question number three, if anybody has one. Okay. So, uh, I'm not from around here, but originally, but when they came here, people were saying, okay, there's the Mount Holyoke range and the Mount Palm range. Are they different ranges, or do the people over on the other side of the river just like to call it the Mount Palm range because they like to have their own range? I think you've, you've hit it on the head, yeah. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's the Holyoke range. All the way down into Connecticut, it's the Holyoke lava, it's the Holyoke rangers. Um, so, it's the Holyoke Range. Okay, well, thank you very much. I will be here for questions if you have any. Otherwise, thanks for your attention. Okay.